Hello, my name is Brian Casey, Editor-in-Chief of AntMini.com. Now in its 21st year, the Mini Awards are radiology's premier awards event, recognizing excellence in multiple areas of medical imaging, from most influential radiology researcher to radiology image of the year. Uh, we have with us today the winner of the Minis Award for Most Influential Radiology Researcher, Dr. Elizabeth Kropinski of Emory University. Dr. Kropinski is Professor and Vice Chair for Research in the Department of Radiology and Imaging Sciences at Emory. Dr. Kropinski, thanks for being with us today. Congratulations. Thank you so very much. It really is uh, quite an amazing honor. Do you have the trophy with you? Uh, yes, I do. See it. All right, look at that. Great. Well, um, thanks so much for being with us today. Um, we'd love to hear more about you and more about your career. I'm, I'm sure a lot of people out there uh, in the radiology world are already really familiar with your work. Um, but uh, if we could start, could you, could you tell us what got you interested in medical imaging from the beginning? Uh, actually, a lot of it was just by pure chance. Um, I actually ended up interviewing physician at uh, University of Pennsylvania uh, for doctors Calvin Nodine and Harold Kendell, who were at the time moving from uh, Temple over to UPenn to start an image perception lab. Uh, Hal was a radiologist and Cal was an educational psychologist and they were looking for an assistant. And I happened to be at that transition point in between uh, master's and PhD program, looking for something more applied in my area of experimental psychology where I could actually make an impact uh, with the work I was doing. That was recommended to me to go ahead and interview. And it just like all of a sudden clicked that this was the way to put all my skills in learning about perception and cognition into something that could actually make a difference in people's lives. Hmm. What were some of the elements of cognition and perception that, that really kind of grabbed your interest? I think the cool thing was that uh, Hal and Cal were starting an eye tracking lab. And uh, I had never really done anything along those lines. I had heard of it. Uh, and at the time, the technology was nowhere near what it is today. Uh, but the ability to really watch what people are looking at when they're in the process of rendering a diagnostic decision and what that can tell you about why they make errors. I mean, that was just to me was absolutely fascinating. So so you you were literally looking at at how radiologists' eyes move around to medical images as, as they're interpreting it? Exactly. Wow, amazing. And now, where did you go from there? Uh, then I, uh, while I was working there, I was also getting my PhD over at Temple. Uh, and then when I got my uh, PhD conferred, at the same time, our grant at, at Penn ran out. Um, and at that point, it was like, well, you know, we really can't keep you here. We can't make you faculty because we don't have any grants. Um, go find a job. And uh, so that's what I did. And I ended up uh, in the Department of Radiology at the University of Arizona and spent 23 years there. Great. Wow. Now, what were some of the what were some of the milestones in your work there at the University of Arizona? I think a lot of it had to do with the with the timing of everything. I got there in the early 90s when we were just making that transition from film to digital. And I ended up working uh, with a medical physicist, Hans Rohrig, for many, many years. And he was an expert on the physical evaluation of display monitors. And uh, people would literally send him new monitors. All the display companies would send him monitors and say, here, evaluate this. And he would look at the individual pixels and everything and say, OK, this is good. But I would say, yeah, OK, it's good in terms of signal to noise ratio, contrast ratio, all that other stuff. but how does a radiologist perform when given this monitor? And so we started a whole series of investigations um, as new monitors came out, new technologies came out, evaluating the impact of those new technologies on the performance of the radiologist in terms of their decision-making, their efficiency, and then in the eye tracking. Yeah. Were, were there some things you found in your research that, that surprised you more than, than other things? Actually, yes. I mean, the, the fact that very small differences in what most people would look at a monitor and say, well, that doesn't really look like a whole lot of a change. It can significantly impact uh, somebody's ability to detect a very subtle lesion. So, for example, as monitors got better and better, the noise properties got better and better. There was there was less noise in, in the in the monitor, so therefore less noise in the images. And it wasn't really all that visible. I mean, it wasn't dramatic, 
Yet these very subtle changes actually, as you decrease the noise in the monitors, increase the performance of the radiologists and their ability to, to render the proper decisions in a, in a quick manner. Mm, wow, that's, that's fascinating. Now, a, a lot of your work was later uh, formed the, the foundation for a lot of the, the monitor calibration standards that we've got out there right now? No, that is correct. Great, um, and and then you also had a role in, in some of the mammography uh, standards that were that were uh, released. That, yeah, right? a lot of the you know a lot of these studies that we did, uh, we utilized mammography images because they are uh, some of the really best test cases. I mean, because of their size, because of the subtlety of the of the masses and the microcalcifications, if you can demonstrate that radiologists can view and detect lesions in mam mammograms, then you can generally be assured that you're going to be able to carry that over into uh, the lower resolution images as well. Great. Um, now, you've been over at Emory for about how long now? Five years. Five years. W what is the focus of your work there at Emory? Uh, most of what I'm doing, it's, it's actually a continuation of what I was doing at Arizona. It's been about the past 10 years is looking at fatigue in radiologists and the impact fatigue. of fatigue. Yeah. Uh, and burnout on their ability to, you know, to, to perform and to diagnose images effectively. And that, that's a huge issue right now. I mean, it, it's a huge issue across healthcare, but it's also very prevalent in radiology right now. What, what do you think are some of the things that are contributing to radiologist burnout? Ah, uh, boy, there's a whole lot of things. I think it's, uh, you know, the, the fundamental change from film images to digital, I think, contributed a lot. Uh, with film, there were, you know, a limited number of images that you could put on the alternator and read. The radiologist then had to step away while new images were put up. And there were these natural breaks built into a schedule. I think that is part of it. Plus the general volume of images. I mean, it's just escalated. Yeah. You know, yeah. More and more images, plus more and more complex images, CT, MRI, much more than it used to be. And then just the whole digital world. I, I think, yeah. you know, staring at a monitor for eight more 12 hours a day, it's, it, there are physiological implications of that that are really ignored in, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I think we're probably all feeling a little bit of burnout <laughs> exactly. from that. But do, do you feel like there are technical solutions to burnout in radiology? Um, some technical, yes, and some, some more practical on the human factor side. Uh, you know, I think AI has huge potential to help with some of this. Um, you know, if there are, are tools that can help uh, the radiologist get through images in a more efficient manner, uh, perhaps by triaging out areas of, you know, or slices on a CT or MRI that, that have no lesions, or pointing out potential lesions to the radiologist, I think that has huge potential. Uh, you know, proper display, proper lighting in the environment, all of these uh, can contribute to uh, reducing levels of fatigue and, and making life uh, e easier to some extent for radiologists. Mm. Anything else going on in AI right now that you find particularly interesting? Uh, I, I, I think the most interesting parts are not necessarily the, you know, segmenting of the images and finding the lesions. That stuff is fascinating, but that's what you hear about every day. I think it's some of the, 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 the background stuff that's going on. Um, the, uh, the AI for getting the, the most effective dose for patients, uh, for being able to tailor uh, some of these imaging uh, modalities and techniques uh, to the individual patient in a much more effective manner and fast. So, I mean, you can bring the patient in, run some of these AI I tools on, you know, like I said, the dose, the distance to the table and all these other things, plus the general workflow. Uh, you know, you've, you've got an ambulance coming in, you've got four different hospitals to choose from, they're, they're all, you know, level one trauma, but which one is already booked up and which one is the most effective? I think there's a lot of AI tools that are looking at workflow issues. And once you get to the individual hospital, which CT device is open and which one's not? So you can make the patient go through the system in a much more effective manner. And I think that that's the fascinating side to me. Yeah, it's interesting. It seems like some of the most exciting and, and most practical uses of AI are in areas where the radiologist won't even see it. Yes, um, no, no, absolutely. And that, that to me should be exactly what it is. I mean, AI should be running in the background. It, it should not be something that's um, out there and, you know, the thing that everybody's paying attention to. 
Great. Well, Dr. Kropinski, thank you so much for being with us. Um, I hope you have a great RSNA this week. It's going to be really exciting to see how this whole virtual format works out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we'll see. But anyway, uh, thank you so much, and uh, and you have a great day. Thank you. Signing off for AntMini.com, my name is Brian Casey.